muted. Uh, welcome to the Occupational Research in Motor Vehicle Safety webinar sponsored by the Society for the Advancement of Violence and Injury Research, or SAVER, and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. My name is Carrie Castile, and I am the president-elect of SAVER. Um, before we get started, as a check, you should see a SAVER slide on your screen. If you don't, please try disconnecting from the webinar and logging back in. And if you're still having problems after logging back in, we can make um, all slide presentations available to you after the webinar. So as you settle in, let me just give you a, a brief overview of what SAVER does. Um, SAVER is a prof professional organization that provides leadership and fosters excellence in the science of preventing and treating injury and violence. SAVER is a leader in injury and violence prevention research, offering access to expertise in the development of research, program, and policy activities, teaching and mentoring of students and early career professionals, and collaboration with practitioners and policymakers with the goal of bridging research, practice, and policy. SAVER is also a very strong and present advocate for improved resources and funding in the field and has been focusing on advancing global injury and violence prevention research. If you would like more information about the organization, including information about member benefits and our conference that's coming, at, coming up in 2017, you can go to our, our website here, www.saverweb.org. Um, now I am pleased to pass the microphone to the webinar moderator, Dr. Stephanie Pratt from NIOSH. Thank you. from the Center for Motor Vehicle Safety at NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. I'd like to thank SAVER for working with us to organize this event. Our goal today is to showcase research presented at the 2015 National Occupational Injury Research Symposium organized by NIOSH. Our presenters represent NIOSH, the University of Kentucky, and Monash University in Australia and the topics are equally diverse. If you have a question, you may type it into the chat box at any time. To ensure that we have sufficient time for all our presenters, we'll hold questions until the end. Now, I'll turn it over to our first <coughs> presenter, my NIOSH colleague, Dr. Jennifer Bell. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, this is Jennifer Bell. I'm a research epidemiologist uh, with NIOSH's Division of Safety Research, and today I'm going to present findings from NIOSH's research study, Evaluation of Telematics Feedback to Oil and Gas Operations Workers to Decrease Risky Driving Behaviors. As far as the need for this type of research, the most recent data available from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics shows motor vehicle-related roadway incidents are the leading cause of work-related death in the oil and gas extraction and related industries. In addition to the burden of fatalities, the support activities for oil and gas operations industry is twice the national average for its rate of transportation-related injuries severe enough to require time away from work. Therefore, the objective of this research was to evaluate whether feedback from a commercially available in-vehicle monitoring system to drivers can reduce the incidence of risky driving behaviors. And from there, it's hypothesized that a reduction in risky driving behaviors uh, may reduce collisions, death, and injury to workers that drive on the job. First, some background on the technology used in this study. The in-vehicle monitoring system collects two types of information about the vehicle and the driver. Accelerometers in the system monitor vehicle performance and have triggering algorithms that detect maneuvers such as hard braking, acceleration, swerving, and other sudden forces. When the triggering thresholds are exceeded, a 30-second video is captured of both inside and outside the vehicle, 15 seconds before and 15 seconds after the triggering event. Then the clips are saved and sent to trained coders to be viewed and coded for risky driving behaviors. Um, again, all the video events were reviewed and coded for approximately 60 different risky driving behaviors, if present, as shown here. Every video event is also assigned a severity category from 0 to 4 based on an increasing scale of safety concern, calculated as the sum of scores assigned to each of the individual coded driving behaviors. So for an example, if the triggered video event just shows a driver 
taking one hand off the wheel to drink coffee while driving. Uh, this is considered a lesser distraction and it would be given a lower score, maybe a one or a two. But if the video event showed a driver driving unbelted, talking on a handheld cell phone in one hand and then taking the second hand off the wheel to drink coffee, the event would have a much higher point value and a higher overall severity rating because it had multiple risky driving behaviors as opposed to just one lesser one. The drivers in the intervention group in this study received two types of feedback. The first was referred to as lights only, instant driver feedback, and was based on vehicle performance only, like hard braking or exceeding maximum fleet speed. The event recorder was mounted on the dash and it had a green light which would flash yellow or red, uh, which were indicators of potentially unsafe driving. The second type of feedback was supervisory coaching, which was given in addition to the lights only feedback. This is where the supervisors could log into an online video response center and view all the video events triggered by a driver. Events that had scored a severity three or four were flagged in the system so they would stand out to the supervisor. And then the supervisors had in-person coaching sessions with any drivers that had severity three or four events occurring that week. The goal of the sessions was to reinforce company policies and safe driving habits and the information was to be presented in a manner to let the drivers know that they were considered to be professionals and the session was like going over game films to improve performance. In addition to these two main types of feedback that went only to the intervention group, there was a low level type of feedback that was given to all sites participating in the study, both intervention and control. And this was feedback for the group or site as a whole with no individuals identified or specific behaviors mentioned. This was in the form of a graph showing miles driven for all drivers at the site combined without a severity three or four event. And if the drivers were improving as a whole, the trend line should go up as miles of safe driving increased. These weekly graphs were prepared and distributed by the telematics vendor to managers and were presented to drivers via display in common areas and at staff meetings to establish the general goal of improving driver behavior with positive supervisor support. NIOSH's industry partner in this research uh, provided maintenance and support activities for oil and gas operations. They were driving pickup trucks, Ford F-150, and they were able to use the trucks for both work-related and personal use driving. Thirteen business locations in seven states were selected by the company to participate and then were randomized to either a intervention or control group. All trucks at each site were equipped with an IVMS recorder, a total of 144 recorders were installed at the start of the study. Events were collected on a per vehicle per 24 hour day basis and a single driver was generally assigned to a vehicle in the study and company records were used to link vehicles to driver assignments. Shown here is the timeline breakdown of the 18 months of the study. Intervention and control groups were monitored for a baseline period uh, with no feedback for five months. Then there were two different intervention groups, group one and group two, that received the same two types of feedback, but they were presented in differing order in a crossover design. Intervention group one received lights only feedback for five months, followed by lights plus coaching feedback for the next five months. Intervention group two received lights plus coaching feedback for the first five months, shown in green, and then lights only feedback for the next five months, shown in purple. And then again, the third control group had events recorded but had no feedback given during the 10-month follow-up period. In what is presented today, the two intervention groups were combined and their collective lights plus supervisory coaching treatment periods, or the two purple, uh, excuse me, the two green, uh, were compared to their collective baseline period. With Same for the lights only feedback in purple. These were combined and compared to their collective five-month baseline period. And for the control group, its entire 10-month follow-up period was compared to its five-month baseline. And then there was a three-month end baseline period for all groups, again, where events recorded, but there was no feedback given. For an outcome measure, we used a count of risky driving behaviors per vehicle per day over hours driven per vehicle per day and expressed this as a rate for 100 hours of driving time. For statistical analysis, we used Poisson regression adjusted for repeated measurements on the same vehicles over time, and we used ProcGenMod and SAS. Over the 18-month observation period, there were over 200,000 total video events recorded. Of these, 
roughly 19% had an obstructed camera view where the driver or external view could not be fully seen and thus could not be fully evaluated by the coders. So we omitted them from the analysis for certain outcomes and we were left with approximately 166,000 video events for the analysis. The most commonly seen risky behavior in the event videos was speeding, and this included three categories, less than or equal to 10 miles an hour over the posted limit, greater than 10 miles an hour over the posted limit, and exceeding maximum speed. The second was lesser distractions, such as eating, drinking, or smoking uh, while driving. And the third most commonly observed risky driving behavior was driving unbelted at 16% of the time. And handheld device use, such as using a mobile phone while driving, ranked fifth overall, and it was a much less commonly encountered behavior at 6%. During the coaching plus lights feedback phase, the supervisors had the goal of meeting with every driver that had severity three or four events driving that week. In practice, coaching varied from site to site, from a low of 80% of drivers that should have been coached at one at one site to a high of 100% of drivers being coached at six other sites. Now I present selected findings from the intervention evaluation. The main outcome measure was the overall rate of risky driving behaviors. This is all events rated severity three or four by the vendor. Over the course of the study, there was an overall decline in risky driving behaviors seen in both the intervention and control groups. This is not an uncommon finding for a company partnering with NIOSH for an intervention study to show general improvements in overall safety over the course of a study. Often companies that partner with us are already on their way to improving safety and continue to do so within the experimental design framework. Uh, and this company in particular did this telematics as a pilot effort within an overall larger safety program. The control group showed a 25% decline in the 10-month follow-up period. In the intervention group, the lights only feedback intervention in purple showed a similar decline to the control group around 26%. And despite the fact that supervisors were not meeting coaching goals 100% of the time, the reduction was greatest in the coaching treatment phase shown in green with a decline of 51% when compared to baseline. In the final three months of the study, where all groups were still being monitored and getting the low level feedback, but no lights or coaching, there was an apparent return to baseline level in the control group and a close to baseline level in the intervention group, neither of which were significantly different from their beginning baseline level. As we interpret these findings, some of the limitations we need to keep in mind are first coaching. In order for coaching to be effective, it needs to be performed. And we found coaching to vary from approximately 80 to 100% of drivers needing it among the sites. There's also the potential for variation in coaching quality and content. Although supervisors were trained on how and on what to coach by the IVMS vendor, because the sessions were private, there's no way to know for sure exact details of how it was performed or what was actually discussed. Another limitation of the study is that 19% overall of the event videos had some form of obstructed view and were omitted from the analysis. The following are a few examples of video events that show obstructed view. For example, in the upper left, we see uh, an external view that's um, kind of messed up. And in this case, it would be hard to see other vehicles or posted speed limit signs, for example. Uh, in the upper right, there's a visor placed over the camera. And when these, uh, when these are installed, the, the telematics vendor feels pretty strongly that any obstruction is purposeful. They, they place it in such a way that it usually it should have a clear view of the driver even when the visor is being used. On um, the bottom left, again, you can see the outside view, but the camera is pointed towards the passenger seat uh, in another view where the driver can't be seen properly. So in summary, supervisory coaching plus lights feedback was found to be highly effective in reducing risky driving behaviors of key interest to fleet managers. Key outcomes measured included overall risky driving, driving unbelted, handheld device use while driving, unsafe stopping, and exceeding maximum fleet speed. Lesser distractions, such as eating, drinking, uh, drinking a beverage, or smoking while driving, all those although these may be considered distractions, did not sh show significant declines during the coaching period. We also found that supervisory coaching plus the lights feedback had a significantly greater impact on reducing risky driving behaviors than lights-only instant driver feedback alone. 
and we saw some evidence that withdrawal of feedback to the individual driver in the final three months return to baseline period was correlated with a return of risky driving behaviors close to initial baseline levels. I just want to thank everyone for uh, your time, and here's my contact information, and I believe there will be a Q&A session at the end for the group. Thank you. Now I'd like to uh, turn it over to Terry Bunn from the University of Kentucky uh, for her presentation. This is Stephanie. Uh, we are not able to hear Terry. Are others able to hear Terry? Good morning. My name is Sharon Newnham. I'm from the Monash University Accident Research Centre. Um, I'll, I'll go on with this presentation and we'll get on to Terry's afterwards. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about workplace road safety and particularly um, going to look beyond the role of the driver, which has been the traditional um, way to manage work-related driving safety. 
So first of all, I'll just introduce you to this the systems approach to workplace road safety. And in this systems approach, um, I'm really looking within the organisation itself as opposed to factors uh, beyond the organisation such, such as regulatory and government body levels. Um, my background is in organisational psychology, so I'm particularly interested uh, to see how the role of management actually, the impact and the role that they play in managing the safety of work-related drivers. So as you'll see in this diagram here, I have three levels. That being the workers themselves, where we have the, the safe working practices, we have line management or the work group supervisor level, and we're looking at safety management practices of these people. And then at the senior management level, we have the, the safety policies and procedures. And, and how this is translated is that the workers, of course, you've got the safety capabilities. So you've got their behaviours, you've got their attitudes, you've got their perceptions of safety in the organisation. At the line management level, you have the safety management skills. And I think this is the level at which there's been very little intervention in the past. And the intervention itself has been very compliance based where, um, as I'll go into in detail later in, the, in my presentation, the challenges associated with managing the safety of work-related drivers and how we can actually develop those safety management skills. Then we've got the senior management level. And why I have arrows between these levels is that I see that the line management or work group supervisor plays a critical role in being able to translate the safety capabilities of what's happening at the driver of drivers at that worker level to effective safety policies and procedures. So that's why I like to look at a systems approach. Unless senior management understand the safety capabilities and are able to clarify the roles and responsibilities of supervisors in the safety management of drivers, uh, there is going to be less of, there's not going to be effective translation of safety policies and procedures. And those policies and procedures need to be relevant and applicable to drivers within the workplace for them to be effective. Otherwise, it tends to be a book that sits on a shelf which a, a driver might may sign a document to say that they've read this document and at induction, but it, it has very little relevance to their everyday driving. So I think it's very important that knowledge translation is actually um, looked at within the approach to workplace road safety. So I'll go on to the next slide that's talking about challenges in this industry. So as I mentioned before, addressing the problem it's always traditionally focused on individual compliance. Let's let's blame the driver for the crash and let's not look beyond uh, what is actually the, the scene of the accident and what actually contributed to the driver engaging in the accident itself. And where a lot of my research has focused on is the role of safety management and safety culture. And I think that this, the, safe, the role of safety management, in particular at the line management level, has been largely overlooked. Uh, because of the, the focus on individual compliance. And I think that there's been a bit of a lack of translation of what safety culture means, particularly in this industry. In this industry, it's, it's very complex. It's not um, the traditional workplace context where the individual actually works within the physical boundaries of the organisation. When a driver gets in the vehicle, they actually leave the physical boundaries of the organisation. Um, so the supervisor, there's challenges in terms of visibility, being able to objectively collect information on their, on their driving behaviour. And with that, um, I think you've got two powerful behaviour modification techniques that have been um, eliminated from the process and that being feedback, timely feedback and goal setting. If you want to change a person's behaviour within the organisation, feedback and goal setting are the most powerful workplace incentives. So this actually creates quite a challenge for safety in the role of safety management. So how do we actually do that? And, and just thinking back on the, the figure that I presented earlier, we need to develop the, the, both the safety capabilities of drivers and the safety management skills of, sup, of those line supervisors. And if those two levels are aligned and um, are well developed, I think that there can be effective translation of safety policies and procedures. And this is what's happened with organisations that I've worked with in the past, that being able to understand those two lower levels in the organisation, um, senior level management can actually go beyond to actually incorporate the kind of context these drivers are working in and the challenges of the safety managers to actually uh, develop effective safety policies and procedures within the organisation. 
So how I've actually looked at developing the safety capabilities of drivers and supervisors, I'll go on to next. So in, at MUARC, um, which is Monash University Accident Research Centre, um, we've developed two workplace road safety programs. And those programs are in safe behaviour in occupational driving and safety management for the occupational driver. So as I said before, these are the two lower levels of the organisational um, context that I'm looking at. So I'm just going to present the, the conceptual framework for these programs because I don't have enough time to go into the results, but I've, I've listed the papers below here that, um, that you're able to access or if you cannot access, please email me and I'm happy to send you through a copy of the papers themselves. But I just wanted to go through the development of those programs. So I'm in the driver development program, I have two stages. The first stage is an organisational climate survey. I think this is critically important. That it's very difficult to be able to change driver behaviour or any behaviour within an organisation unless you understand the context in which that worker is actually performing their work within. So the organisational climate survey looks at things like not only the driving conditions and past driving history, but it looks at the organisational factors. So the driver's experience of workload in the organisation, their perceptions of safety, even their belief in their own capability to drive safely. So these things are really important in being able to understand crash involvement. And that's what a lot of my previous research has looked into, is what are these factors that are influencing safe driving behaviour. What I actually do with this research, this stage one, is to actually analyse that data and then move into stage two. And in stage two, I have a group-based a group based behaviour modification session. I generally have around 20 to 30 drivers within these sessions and go through three uh, primary stages. And that's delivering that feedback to drivers. So this is what you told me as a group about your types of driving behaviours, such as speeding, rule violation, distraction while driving, tiredness while driving. Um, this, is your, this is what you told me in terms of your perceptions of safety within this organisation, your experience of workload, uh, your attitudes towards safety. So it's actually setting the context for what, what I understand about the organisation and it's also presenting objective statistics. So in, in the past I've been able to um, access insurance information, so looking at the different types of claims and how that organisation compares to similar organisations. Um, I'm able to access some speed infringement data as well. It's really getting any data to actually begin that persuasion process to challenging a driver's belief about unsafe driving practices. What I do with that information then is actually break the, the drivers into groups. And in those groups, we can actually discuss reasons for why they drive unsafely. And generally within organisations that I work with, the four primary behaviours that they need to, that, that are most problematic is speeding, rule violation, um, driving while tired, mobile phone use and distraction while driving. And so in those groups, they actually discuss the reasons for why they're driving unsafely. Uh, the third part of this behaviour modification program is the goal setting component. So it's getting drivers then to reflect on the reasons for why they drive unsafely and to generate strategies to avoid those reasons, those, those kind of behaviours in future driving scenarios. Now my rationale for this approach is that we're creating a community of practice by these group discussions. It's the drivers actually discussing the reasons why they are driving unsafely and then getting to the level of going, well yes, this is why we do and this is how we generate strategies that I can generate a strategy to avoid it. And it's learning from other people's experience at the same time. So it's people imparting their own knowledge and then learning from other people's knowledge. And it's quite an effective approach in, in terms of being able to gain consensus within the group. And that consensus is actually really important in cementing that, um, that the stage in which you're able to challenge their key salient beliefs associated with these types of unsafe driving behaviours. So in organisations that I've worked with in the past, we've, we've been able to see, and these are the papers that are listed below, that um, I monitored overspeed violations through onboard diagnostic tools over a, a five week period. Uh, through using this intervention approach and we found that we're able to uh, significantly reduce overspeed violations. 
So that was a very promising, from pre to post intervention, sorry, I should say. So um, we looked at the baseline uh, overspeed violations, uh, two weeks, and then a post intervention, um, two week period of baseline um, um, post intervention overspeed violations. So it was very nice to be able to see that this type of approach was effective in challenging a driver's key beliefs about unsafe driving behaviour. So this is one intervention, as I was saying, and the second program we've developed within the centre is a safety management program. So this is the level which has, has really intrigued me in recent years because all of the ty different types of safety leadership programs out there are very much focused on compliance based. Um, you look at the occupational health and safety guidelines and this is what a supervisor must do in their role as a supervisor in the safety management of, of a worker within an organisation. However, when you've got the challenge of a worker, um, a remote worker, how does that actually operate? Because in many instances, unless you've got the in-vehicle telemetry, a supervisor doesn't have direct visibility of a driver's behaviour. So for many organisations, this is a challenge. And so how do we actually develop a culture in which drivers actually perceive that safety is valued and prioritised within the organisation unless they're getting feedback on their behaviour and the supervisor is able to work with them in their goal setting exercises. And this is very much echoing what Jennifer was talking about in her presentation about how effective that supervisor coaching was. And I think it's that one-on-one -on -one interaction between drivers and supervisors that are so effective in actually creating this cultural context in which safety can actually be aligned to the, to the goals and or the safety goals and priorities of the organisation. So in this safety management pro program, I actually focus on developing the skills of supervisors in identifying situations in which drivers at risk on the road and managing those situations effectively. And how I actually do that is through my past research, which has looked at both clarifying the roles and responsibilities of supervisors in the safety management of drivers. And I think this, this whole compliance component is, is extremely important. Uh, both line managers and senior level managers, they need to understand the, their roles in, in the responsibility of work-related drivers, both when they're in the organisation and when they work ex externally as well. Um, along with that, you've got this self-efficacy component. So drivers or supervisors, excuse me, need to believe that they can effectively integrate their safety management within existing roles and responsibilities within the organisation. And I think this is quite challenging and um, this is where I've come across um, some challenging challenges in the past because supervisors have said, um, what am I supposed to do about driver safety? They're, I'm in the office, um, they're out on the road, how am I supp supposed to create um, a safer driver behaviour? And um, I've always said, well, yeah, you do. You actually can through creating this culture, this context in which safety is valued and prioritised. And it, it might seem very much of a, um, a soft approach, but this concept of culture is so important. And so being able to integrate safety management and really focusing on communication skills, um, persuasion, um, being able to actually convey that the driver's dri there's concern for driver health and well-being is critically important. This third component, mindfulness, and, and that's really looking at attention to and awareness of a cultural a context in which safety is valued and prioritised. And mindfulness, it, it, in past programs that I have delivered, it, it's focusing on issues such as fatigue. So if you're not actually looking, you're not if, if a supervisor isn't in a position to visit, physically view a driver before they go out in the road, how do they know if a driver is fatigued, for example? So it's being able to connect with your driver um, on, a, on a daily basis, understand what, what is happening in their lives, if there is this potential for fatigue, um, what do you do about that? Um, basically having backup plans in place. And, and that's what we work on in the mindfulness um, con construct within this program. And, and what really ties this program all together is this idea of pro-social motivation. And so in pro-social motivation, I'm really looking at trying to promote um, supervisors or the perception that drivers' health and well-being is cared for by the supervisor. And this is very, again, much of a soft approach. And um, in, a, in a past program that I delivered, 
it was under the negative feedback section where a supervisor said um, she is trying to create new psychologists of us. And I thought, well, that's not negative feedback. I actually think that's quite positive because, yeah, I actually do because it's a very challenging context to be able to apply your safety management skills and communication and being able to understand drivers and being able to convey that concern for health and wellbeing is how you're actually going to change the culture and to engage with drivers and get them to align their safety uh, values and priorities to your own. So in a way, I think you are trying to create mini psychologists from supervisors. So that's why I'm thinking, I think that the safe supervisors um, play a very critical role in the safety management of drivers. So um, I have a, a a reference down the bottom there that uh, briefly discusses the conceptual development of this program and um, a paper that's um, hopefully soon going to be accepted. But please send me through your um, an email if you would like me to send through the paper to you if you're unable to access those. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, are we ready for Terry's presentation? Good afternoon, this is Terry Bunn, Director of the Kentucky Injury Prevention and Research Center and Associate Professor in the Department of Preventive Medicine and Environmental Health here at the University of Kentucky College of Public Health. Um, our NIOSH-funded Kentucky Occupational Safety and Health Surveillance Program, or CAUCUS as we call it, focuses on the surveillance of non-fatal and fatal occupational injuries and illnesses including the surveillance of occupational motor vehicle um, injuries as well as transportation related injuries. The Kentucky Injury Prevention Research Center receives this funding as a bona fide agent for the Kentucky Department for Public Health. Our program has a priority focus on motor vehicle injury prevention since multiple data sources identify occupational motor vehicle collisions as the leading cause of worker death as well as one of the leading causes of non-fatal -work worker injury in Kentucky. If you look at year 2013 data, we had over 11,000 occupational motor vehicle collisions in Kentucky, and approximately 6,000 of them involved commercial vehicles. Semi-truck collisions accounted for over half of the commercial motor vehicle collisions. This is a busy slide, so I'm not going to discuss everything here, but using state crash data, you can see that in 2013, we had about 300 non-fatal and nine fatal injuries associated with commercial vehicle collisions. Semi-trucks were involved in approximately 4,500 of the commercial vehicle collisions. Using workers' compensation first report of injury, or FROI data, there were about 1,200 occupational motor vehicle uh, FROIs in two, 2013 with an associated rate of about 62 FROIs per 100,000 employees. The rates dropped um, significantly from the year 2000 where it was 98 FROIs per uh, 100,000 workers and has dropped uh, even more since 2008, but since 2008 has remained level for about the past five years. Our cautious program uh, focuses on both population-based as well as case-based surveillance of occupational motor vehicle injuries. Population-based surveillance of occupational motor vehicle collisions uses primarily crash, workers' compensation, trauma registry, and our fatality assessment and control evaluation surveillance data, or FACE data. We also perform case-based surveillance of occupational motor vehicle deaths through our FACE program on-site investigations. For the current NIOSH funding cycle, we're also performing epidemiological studies of occupational motor vehicle collisions, developing driver safety trainings, and establishing new transportation safety partnerships at both the state and national levels. 
One of our current epidemiological studies has been submitted to the International Journal of Injury Control and Safety Promotion and was presented in a poster session at NORS this last May. This study focuses on the narrative and qualitative analyses of short-haul and long-haul trucking injuries using workers' compensation FROI data. The aims of the study were to characterize the differences between long-haul and short-haul trucking injuries, to describe typical injury scenarios from the free text data field within the FROIs, and to develop targeted recommendations to prevent long-haul and short-haul trucking injuries. We used 2012 FROI data for the study with 739 cases total. The nice thing about using Kentucky workers' compensation data is that in Kentucky, the worker only needs to miss one day of work to file a workers' compensation claim. We had 284 long-haul FROIs and 455 short-haul FROIs within our final data set. Looking at the demographics, a higher proportion of injuries among those under 25 years of age occurred in short-haul trucking compared to those in long-haul trucking. And there were higher proportions of long-haul trucking injuries that occurred in workers aged 25 to 44 compared to those of the same ages in short-haul trucking. We found a statistically significant difference in the length of time between hire and date of injury between the two trucking groups. There were higher proportions of short-haul trucking injuries that occurred among those employed less than 30 days and among those employed longer than um, three years. In contrast, higher proportions of long-haul trucking injuries occurred between mon one month and three years of employment. Kentucky FROIs are industry coded with either NAICS or SIC industry codes. We found that looking at short-haul trucking, they were identified um, using both trucking industry codes. For long-haul trucking um, injuries, about three-quarters of them were identified using only um, related SIC codes. Looking at the occupations, the highest percentage of FROIs for both long-haul and short-haul trucking were for truck driver injuries. There was a higher percentage of FROIs for drivers in long-haul trucking compared to those in short-haul trucking. And there was a higher percentage of laborer FROIs in short-haul trucking compared to long-haul trucking. Looking at the injury characteristics and activities, there were higher proportions of lifting and cranking and truck operation FROIs in short-haul trucking compared to long-haul trucking whereas the highest proportion of long-haul trucking FROIs was due to opening, closing, and adjusting injuries. When we looked at the typical injury scenarios, you can see that typical truck operation short-haul truck driver injury scenarios included vehicle overturns, vehicle sliding, and hitting fixed objects. Typical lifting and cranking short-haul injury, um, truck driver injury scenarios included ramp and dolly maneuvering. Representative cab and trailer maneuvering short-haul truck driver injury scenarios involved cab ingress and egress injuries and trailer falls primarily. Looking at long-haul truck driver injury scenarios, um, and those related to securing, opening, closing, and adjusting, most of those were related to um, trailer opening and closing injuries and trailer tarping injuries. Lifting and cranking long-haul truck driver FROIs involved primarily trailer cranking and trailer deck injuries. Last, long-haul truck driver um, cab-related FROIs, similar to short-haul truck driver cab-related FROIs, involved mainly cab ingress and egress injuries. 
Based on these qualitative data results from the study, scaffolding and tarping systems, as well as ladders, may help prevent these injuries associated with tarping. Looking at the trailer door injuries, they may be um, reduced by injury prevention controls such as remote control trailer door openers. To prevent cab ingress and egress injuries, several um, injury prevention controls are suggested. First, an employer safety policy that requires slip-resistant footwear may be considered. Second, slip-resistant safety covers can be applied to truck cab steps to increase traction. And while most trucks are manufactured with handlebars for support while entering and exiting the cab, it's recommended that one be installed just inside the driver's side door that extends from the floorboard to dash height. Having that interior handle prevents it from getting wet and prevents slipping. Last, trucking injuries should emphasize and re-emphasize the importance of maintaining three points of contact um, with a truck at all times when entering and exiting the cab. For example, um, one foot and two hands or two feet and one hand. So in conclusion of this epidemiological study, narrative analysis in addition to quantitative analysis, identifies additional specific risk factors for short-haul short specific and long-haul specific trucking injuries. And these findings can help inform both intrastate and interstate trucking injury prevention control strategies. Um, I believe we're, um, I'm happy to take any questions now and happy to turn it over um, to uh, Stephanie to start the Q&A session. Thanks very much, Terry. Uh, I'll encourage anyone who has a question to type it into the chat box. Um, for now, what I'll do is I'll start off uh, with a question to Sharon uh, to get us going. Sharon, you talked about the need to develop programs that would address uh, driver concerns, the, the need to encourage safe driving behaviors, and then also to train the managers. But when you did the, the driver training itself, did they also identify structural issues about their jobs that where management needed to be engaged, as well as ways that they could personally uh, drive more safely? Absolutely. I think that that's one of the the things I wasn't able to go into this about, but um, a good example is in an organisation that I recently delivered the, the driver and the, the safety management program to, uh, how, we, how it worked out, I do the driver program first to really understand the driving context and the organisational factors influencing safety. Um, I then use that information in the driver session themselves with the drivers actually talking about those issues, why that why these unsafe driving behaviours are occurring, um, the types of management issues. Um, I can then elevate that information to the to the safety management program and use that to actually develop a context specific tailored approach to safety management within that organisation. So it, it's a very it's a very um, a neat way of looking at a more holistic program within the organisation. And I think the, um, the most positive thing that came out of this organisation is that the, the information that was generated not only in the driver but the supervisor program was then translated into some um, updated safety policies and procedures in the organisation. So the senior executive actually identified that these were the reasons why drivers are, unsa are driving unsafe and these are the, the, the strategies that they generated to avoid these scenarios. Um, this is what was discussed in the safety management program in terms of what safety managers can do to actually try to help drivers avoid these unsafe driving scenarios. So then we'll translate in this into a policy and procedure and it was quite effectively done. Okay. Thanks. Um, I don't see any questions from attendees, so I'm, I'm going to move forward with a question for Jennifer. Um, Jennifer, what do you feel like you learned from your study that would help employers to be more successful in implementing an IVMS program in their own companies? Well, uh, so we have a few lessons learned uh, both from our own experience 
and also some compiled from a variety of other companies that have implemented this technology, um, a few of which came from a uh, Purdue Farms Incorporated and their telematics vendor. Um, so some of these are to, when putting out this kind of program, to develop a rollout plan that commu includes communication to all the stakeholders, so human resources, legal operations, uh, the workforce, if unions are present, uh, make sure everyone knows ahead of time about the plan and people have time to work out any issues or concerns before the rollout of the program. Um, some other recommendations uh, from people that have done this before were to not institute new policies in conjunction with the rollout, but rather to use the new safety technology to reinforce policies and expectations already in place. Um, Another suggestion was to include a grace period for most behaviors because change could be difficult. Uh, maybe give drivers a set period of time where they can receive warnings before any kind of disciplinary action would be taken. Uh, and again, to in general, people do better with positive reinforcement, so make sure good driving practices are identified uh, with the technology as well and recognized along with um, you know any driving behaviors that you don't want to see continued. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Now, we have a question, and I, I have a feeling that both Jennifer and Sharon would be able to address this in, in some way, but I'll ask you to be brief in your answer so we can address some additional questions. The question is, is it critical that one-on-one -on -one driver coaching be done by the supervisor versus a driver trainer, driver lead person, or another driver? Uh, Jennifer, would you like to try to address that one? You know, I can just very briefly, I, I don't think, based on what's in the published literature, I don't think there's a, uh, as far as I know, a, a published gold standard. I think it can vary whether it's the supervisor, whether it's a peer, um, and maybe Sharon and her, I mean, I think that the personal feedback is important, um, but I don't know whether it's clear cut. The supervisor would obviously have more, potentially more weight than a peer in um, you know, how the behaviors are handled, but Sharon, with her psychology background, <laughs> yes, <laughs> this is, I suppose, my um my my pet area. I like this um this particular question the most, and I would say that the supervisor plays a very critical role in being able to translate that information to the driver, um, because they're in a position of authority that they are accountable for drivers' safety drivers actually respond to that. So my research has found that the supervisors themselves can create a context in which safety is valued and prioritized, which means it's their leadership practices, I believe, that are actually that are instrumental in creating that context. So the supervisor being able to engage with the driver creates a more sustainable system within the organization. So if you get an external person coming in, well, that relationship hasn't developed. You need that role development uh, between a supervisor and a driver for the feedback to be most effective um, and for follow-up to occur subsequent to that too. Does that answer your question? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask a question of Terry. Uh, truck drivers are a very difficult group of workers to reach. Um, can you tell us more about strategies that your program is using to inform trucking companies and drivers about the findings from uh, this research and others? Yeah, sure. I think the first is, um, just as I said in like my second slide or so, is to form those critical relationships and partnerships. We have a great partner with the Kentucky Trucking Association, and we are on their safety council, so we attend monthly meetings. Um, with trucking companies um, throughout the state and have made personal relationships with individual um, companies. So I think that that is very important for, uh, first of all, uh, just getting a, a good idea of what their needs are. And second, they are they're great partners in that for every um, publication, that we produce, all of the um, interventions that we produce, they're really um, great in offering to review what we produce to make sure that um, what we're, uh, first of all, that we're speaking the correct jargon, second, that we've um, targeted um, the problems and the solutions correctly, and um, that any recommendations that we produce 
are uh, feasible and practical. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to pass on a, a brief comment uh, to Sharon, uh, which is, uh, good for you turning your managers into psychologists. It's critical to have a mini-me in as many locations or positions as possible. So perhaps a, a comment from a psychologist. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and direct another question back to Jennifer. Uh, her thoughts about why risky driving behaviors returned after the intervention. Uh, at this point, we're not 100% sure uh, why they returned. It may have been, um, or one potential reason is, is that because this was a pilot effort by the company, it was not something that was rolled out across its entire workforce. Uh, they may not have wanted to treat the drivers differently. So I don't know at that point whether there's any kind of really strong positive or negative uh, consequences for the behavior or the return of the behavior. Um, you know, it may be if we could document what happened after coaching sessions or what would happen if, again, if there was not reinforcement, we would know a little more strongly why this occurred. Okay. Uh, thanks. One, uh, one more question to Terry. Uh, Terry, based off the data you provided, did you see a difference between owner operators and company drivers? Did one experience more injuries than the other? Okay, well, with this study, since it's based on workers' compensation data, these would primarily represent company drivers, not owner operators, because um, if you are self-employed, you don't need to um, have workers' compensation insurance. But that doesn't mean that um, some um, owner operators may not have been represented because some are leased to companies. So I could not distinguish between the two for the study, unfortunately, but I would say um, just um, anecdotally, it probably represented primarily company drivers. Okay, thank you, Terry. Uh, one more question, and I'll direct this to Sharon. Where does risk assessment fit into the safe system approach? and which workplace parties are involved? Um, I would definitely say um, at all levels of the organisation to, to, to be most effective. And I think a, a systems approach to, to risk assessment is, is vitally important. Senior level management would need to lead that. They, there needs to be commitment from senior level management in establishing um, even down to the procedures in terms of identifying risk management within the organisation. Um, I think even the post-crash stage as well. So looking at ways to actually um, develop some systems-based crash investigation methods to identify the factors actually that contributed to the crash and then to develop countermeasures um, that, that, are, that are looking at not only at the scene of the action, accident itself, but um, the role that management played in that, the role that senior level management played, um, and beyond that the, to the role of regulators and government bodies. So I think that um, it, it definitely needs to be um, a strategy that is led by senior level management, but I think all levels of management should be involved in that risk management pro approach. Uh, we're just a couple minutes past our hour. Um, I'd like to thank all our presenters for uh, such a, an engaging and varied uh, set of topics. Uh, I believe that the slides will be distributed to all uh, the attendees. And if you like this webinar, if you like this topic, and if you'd like to see more, I'll stick my neck out and say, let's save or no, and we'll be happy to uh, provide uh, lots more good research uh, to tell you about. Thanks, everyone, for uh, participating and for your questions. <laughs>